USB thingies do you have at your house? I just realized that practically everything I own has some kind of USB plug. My phone, of course. My computer. <laughs> Duh. Cameras. Cars. Coffee makers. Heck, this microphone. I think it's just a matter of time before my chickens start laying eggs with little USB ports on them. Ouch. That's gotta hurt. <laughs> and how much time have you spent trying to plug in your USB in the wrong way? I'm pretty sure I could have done something useful with all that time. Well, the USB gods have heard my cry, and help is on the way. In the form of the new USB-C. USB-C is faster, provides more power for charging, has more features, and, my personal favorite, can plug in either way. Yes! Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Before I can start living my new life of USB-C bliss, you folks have to actually put it into your designs. And that might be a bit tricky considering all the new fancy handshaking and stuff. Never fear. Our guest today is Gordon Hands of Lattice Semiconductor. And Gordon is going to chat with us about a solution that will make USB-C implementation a walk in the park. Also, before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can download a free tech packet with all sorts of information about this new USB-C. Hi, Gordon. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, uh, no, thanks for spending some time with us. We appreciate it. So practically everything I own has a USB. Now, what the heck is this type C business? And it's going to make my USB life better? How so? Oh, you bet. So uh, USB type C is really going to revolutionize what's happening relative to USB connections. So when we look at what USB type C is going to enable, it's going to do things like give people up to 100 watts for faster charging. Okay. You're going to get over 10 gigabits of bandwidth for faster downloads. One thing that's really cool is you can get this small reversible connector. So I don't know how many times you end up having to plug the USB connector in and then figure it's the wrong way and switch it. Hours of my life wasted doing yeah. that. <laughs> so solved, problem solved. Excellent. Also has some really interesting flexible video modes that allow you to pipe video data right across the USB cable. Okay. And some very interesting flexible vendor define modes where people can really define their own function. So type C was something that was standardized back in the middle of last year, actually August 2014. What we're seeing is some of the leaders in consumer electronics are readying their first products, and they expect to be launched in kind of mid of this year, so sometime June, July 2015. Excellent. All right. Nerd goggles are on. Let's open up this bad boy and see what's under the hood. What's the goods in this Type C? Well, you know, rather than the prior USB, which only had a few conductors, Type C gives uh, designers 24 pins. Cool. And Basically, what you have is a few pins to do the uh, legacy USB 2.0. Okay. And then we have a couple of channels of transmit and receive for the high-speed USB 3.1, a few sideband signals. And then very importantly, there's a couple of signals called CC1 and CC2, cable configuration 1 and cable configuration 2. And these are really the secret handshakes that unlock a lot of the capability and power of a USB Type-C. And ah. then, of course, there's power and ground as well. Okay, now let's go back to this cable configuration, secret handshake business. <laughs> Tell me more about that. Sure. So when we look at Type-C, there's really kind of two functions that are critical for unlocking the capability that the standard provides. Okay. So one's called cable detect, or at least as lattice we refer to it as cable detect, and the other is called power delivery. When we look at the most basic Type-C connection, perhaps if you just want USB 2.0 data, you can live with the default, which basically is 5 volts, and you get 900 milliamps of capability. You're okay being a device, or in the new terminology of a USB, a upstream-facing port. Actually, you don't need any of these secret handshakes. You can just set a few resistors on the board and operate. Oh, okay. 
But if you want to start to unlock some of the other capabilities, then you start to have to look at implementing the CD function and the PD function. Okay. For instance, if you wanted to access higher current, say 1.5 amps or 3 amps, or maybe you want to make use of the audio accessory mode that's in uh, Type C, so you can remove that old style 3.5 millimeter connector from your design. Yeah. Or perhaps you want not just to operate as a device, but you also need to operate as a host. Or in the brave new world of uh, USB terminology, a DFP or downstream facing port. Mm -hmm. Or maybe even uh, more exciting, a, a DRP, a dual role port. You're going to need to implement the CD functionality. Ah, oh, okay. The PD functionality adds yet more capabilities. So if you want to do things like the high-speed USB 3.1 data, Maybe you want to get more power across the interface up to 20 volts or 5 amps. Or perhaps you wanted to allow the host and device to swap power and data roles or enable these kind of unique alternate video modes or, mm -hmm. or do something even more unique using these unstructured VDMs. Then you need to turn on this kind of PD capability. Excellent. All right, Gordon, this looks cool, but how does the FPGA fit in here? Sure. So I think what we've done as Lattice is we've developed four different scalable solutions for our users. So I'm showing those on the slide that we're looking at right at the minute. Uh huh. So the simplest solution that we've implemented, we refer to as the CDPD5, can be used for either hosts or devices. And we basically implement the cable detect and the physical layer of the power delivery standard. Okay. And then the rest of the logic can be implemented in the designer's processor, say an application processor or a CPU. Moving to the right on the slide, the next most complex solution we have we refer to as PD for chargers. So this is really a solution tailored for people that are doing chargers to support USB Type C. Okay. In essence, provides people with a self-contained function that implements all the cable detect and power delivery that would be required in a charger. Ah, okay. Down in the bottom left, we're showing how we implement a standalone CDPD function where we not only implement all those kind of physical layer interfaces, but we put the logic behind the physical layer so that our device can negotiate the power delivery mm -hmm. and then also the data speeds across the link. Ah, okay. On the bottom right, I'm showing the most complex of the solutions we're doing, which adds to our solution the ability to do switching of video, so supporting the alternate video modes, mm. and also that allows designers to mix in some uh, general purpose I.O. So you might imagine how this is useful in a dock. So you want to pass video between the device and the dock device. And right. then maybe you've got some GPIO, you know, got those pesky little LEDs mm -hmm. and on-off switches, and you want to be able to talk to them and control those things. Right. And this really enables that. Okay, and I see you guys aren't actually in the signal path. You're doing the negotiations and the handshaking. Am I right there? Yeah, exactly. So what we found is there's a lot of great solutions out there that support the various different levels of USB. Mm -hmm. And the kind of missing component as uh, Type-C has kind of come onto the scene is really how to implement the cable detect and pad delivery function. So that's really where we're mm. focused as Lattice. And it turns out that some of the very low-cost, low-power devices that we use in the consumer market mm -hmm. are also very applicable to this particular application. Sure, that makes sense. So, Gordon, you sure have some nice blog diagrams here, but what really makes an FPGA special in an implementation like this one? Yeah, so I'm glad you kind of asked, because, you know, as we're working with people, that's a very common question. Sure. What we're finding is, particularly the physical layer, is quite complex. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of very tight timing, some special signal encoding that's needed. So the standard uses an encoding called BMC. Okay. Uh, and then behind that, there has to be a 4B, 5B encoder, and then some CRCs and some other functions that are fairly timing critical. And it turns out that the kind of state machine logic we can do within an FPGA is great at implementing those functions. Mm. So we can implement those functions very efficiently and at very low power. Perhaps some of the other approaches, such as using a microcontroller, find those much harder to implement and achieve the function. They have to run at quite high clock rates, and mm. that leads to a lot of power. Sure. So we really use that kind of state machine implementation for the two blocks that I'm showing on the left-hand side of this diagram. 
And then the great thing about an FPGA is, of course, we can do soft microcontroller and combine that with logic as well. Yeah. And we're doing that for the two blocks on the left-hand side. Mm. And the reason that we chose to do that is those two blocks are all to do with implementing uh, the policy engine, basically how we negotiate power mm -hmm. and data capabilities across the link. And uh, we see a lot of people want to make changes and customizations there. The great news is it's really easy to make those customizations if you're doing it in code rather than having to do it in uh, HDL. Right. Okay, so for something as ubiquitous as USB, a lot of people would just assume that an ASSP would be the way to go or maybe microcontroller. But why FPGA here? Yeah. As we look at what people are trying to do within the consumer electronic space, as they think about type C, we find that engineers really have four things on their mind. Okay. So the first thing is, hey, can I hit my power budget? True, yeah. Secondly, can I hit my cost budget? Mm -hmm. And then, particularly with type C, there's a lot of worry, hey, is the standard going to change? Do I fully even understand how I'm going to utilize the standard? Sure. So how can I have flexibility and provision for upgrade? And then lastly, can I get this function in the right package? So mm -hmm. if I'm doing a smartphone, obviously I want a very tight pitch BGA package. Mm -hmm. Perhaps if I'm doing a notebook computer or a dock, I want a, a slightly wider pitch package or maybe even a peripheral lead kind of device. So as we look at what's available out in the marketplace, with the ASSPs, of course they have great power. They have good cost, but they're really restricted in terms of the flexibility for doing upgrades right. and changes. And of course, they have all the right packages. When we look at people that are trying to solve this with microcontrollers, we see there are really two challenges. So the first one is most of the microcontrollers that the people are using, they're on relatively old technologies and they have embedded flash and that's pushing mm -hmm. the cost structure up. Sure. What we're also seeing is they have to run the clocks on those microprocessors relatively fast in order to implement all this complicated encoding mm. and CRCs and so forth associated with the physical layer. And that's really driving the power up. So we see in our FPGA solution, when we're fully active, we're taking about seven milliwatts. And when we look at the microcontroller solutions, it looks like they're running somewhere between 50 milliwatts and 100 milliwatts to do the same function. Wow, okay. And then, of course, the microcontroller is you know fairly flexible and comes in the right packaging. FPGA, we think, checks all the boxes. So we have the low power, low cost, the flexibility, and the appropriate packaging. So that's why we're seeing a lot of interest right at the moment for people implementing USB Type-C using the FPGA devices. All right, I'm sold, Gordon. What do you have to help me get started? We've been kind of busy honing our solution with our lead customers over the last three to six months. Okay. So we've already figured out how to successfully deliver solutions in the charger space, the tablet space, and the smartphone space. And in fact, there was a plug fest back in November in Cambridge, UK, where we participated with one of our partners and successfully demonstrated interoperation. We expect to take our solutions also to the plug fest that's occurring in April in Milpitas here in the U.S. Expect to be able to fully certify what we're doing at that point. Those certifications are going to be based on what we've developed, and we've kind of packaged that up as a set of code, so mm -hmm. a reference design code, as schematics and bills of material, and that's available on request as we speak. Excellent. And there's also a development board or a development system that kind of goes along with that. Very cool. All right. Give me a quick recap, if you wouldn't mind, Gordon. Yeah, you bet. So when we look at USB Type-C, we think that this is going to dramatically impact innovation in the mobile consumer space. The adoption is really being driven by the high power that we provide, the additional bandwidth, the alternate video modes, and this really cool small reversible connector. As Lattice, we provide four proven solutions in the charger space, a, a CDPD Phi solution, a CDPD solution for host devices, and then an advanced version for docs. Mm -hmm. We think that those solutions address all of the kind of key requirements that uh, designers have. So low power, low cost, the right packaging, and the flexibility for upgrade. So if you're interested in finding out a little bit more, there's a link that's going to be coming up on the screen in a second. And I invite you and uh, all of the listeners to check it out. Excellent. I'll go there right now. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me, Gordon. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Yeah, likewise. It's been real fun. Thanks. 
before we go. Don't forget to click that link. There you can download a free tech packet with further information about this new USB-C. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton. For more Chalk Talks, check out the EE Journal YouTube channel or the on-demand section of eejournal.com.